our keynote speaker today, uh, Dr. Brad Schlager. Uh, I met uh, Brad uh, when he was a medical student at Washington University, I think in 1994, I believe. And, uh, and then since then, um, you know, have uh, kept in, in touch with him and watched uh, his, uh, you know, terrific, uh, you know, career uh, evolve and take shape. Um, we are truly uh, honored to have Brad speaking to us uh, this morning. Uh, Dr. Schlager serves as the, uh, is currently the president and CEO of the Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. And he holds the uh, endowed Zanville Krieger uh, chair at the Kennedy Krieger. He is also a professor of neurology and pediatrics at Johns Hopkins University. And at the Institute, he uh, uh, is uh, leading a team of about 2,700 uh, uh, individuals, uh, quite a, a daunting uh, task. Um, over there, he has the, uh, uh, he is basically leading their efforts in uh, the longstanding mission of the Institute of Improving the Lives of Children, Adolescents, Young Adults with uh, Disorders of Brain Injury, Spinal Cord, and the like. And I can tell you that, um, you know, they do make uh, a very, very uh, big difference uh, in, uh, in what is being done uh, in leading this uh, effort. And we're very thankful for everything that they contribute to this field. Uh, before joining the Kennedy Krieger in 2018, uh, um, Dr. Schlager was uh, a faculty member and also actually uh, led the Division of Child Neurology at Washington University and, uh, in St. Louis uh, and St. Louis Children's Hospital, where he served as the division head of uh, pediatric and developmental neurology and also the co-director of the intellectual and developmental uh, intellectual. Uh, Disabilities Research Center. Um, Dr. Schlager's clinical interests are in pediatric movement disorders, including Tourette syndrome and developmental disorders of language and, uh, and cognition. And uh, in regards to you know, folks who are uh, members of the Child Neurology Society and things, he was uh, also has been a uh, you know, winner of the uh, Young Investigator Award uh, in the uh, John Rodney Society, which is a very uh, meaningful and prestigious award, uh, which is uh, named in honor of uh, uh, our uh, dear Dr. Philip Dodge, who was the founder of the Division of Char Neurology at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, and also one of the uh, sort of leaders and pioneers uh, in finding and sort of founding the field of, of child neurology. So very, very special award. And, uh, and so uh, with that uh, introduction, uh, we all look forward to uh, hearing from Dr. Schlager today. We give him a warm, uh, you know, uh, welcome. It's pretty warm and humid in Louisville this morning. And uh, Brad, Thank you so much. And uh, we really appreciate you joining us this morning. Well, thank you, Vinay. And uh, it's a really a pleasure to, to join you and to reminisce about meeting you uh, all those years ago. You mentioned uh, our dear Dr. Dodge. Uh, I don't know if you recall, but uh, that service that I joined where you were the PGY4 resident uh, fellow, uh, Phil was our attending. Yes. And how could I do anything but be a child neurologist uh, with, with that uh, entree into the discipline? So I'm gonna share my slides. I hope you can see my screen. And, um, and uh, I'm gonna talk about the, the uh, I think a, a passion of mine, which is the prioritizing individuals and individual differences in studying children with neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, my disclosure slide, nothing to disclose today. And uh, you heard that I, I joined about three years ago, uh, the Kennedy Krieger Institute, uh, an outrageous opportunity to take the helm of this uh, really significant institution uh, that has a footprint in not just patient care, but also uh, a research institute. We also have special education. We have a system of schools that serve 
about 500, something more than 500 students with uh, intellectual uh, disabilities, but also with uh, significant comorbid behavioral issues and uh, often medically complex students who are, are not, whose needs are not met by local schools, then refer them to us. We have a lot of community programs. We have, we train, we have the, one of the largest LEND programs, the, the largest LEND program in the country, training nearly a thousand trainees through our doors. And we have the Maryland Center for Developmental Disabilities. Uh, so we're an advocacy engine as well. As a consequence of taking this position, I, I basically stepped away from running my own research lab that I had for 20 years at, at WashU. And uh, it, it sort of puts me in a more reflective position on, on the field as a whole, which I'd like to share with you this morning. My, my journey into, uh, I was, my graduate work was in developmental neurobiology, but my journey into being more of a developmental cognitive neuroscientist, I really started as a consequence of seeing a patient with Dr. Dodge uh, at the Shriners Hospital in St. Louis back in 1998 when I was a PGY4 resident. I uh, saw so this eight-year-old left-handed boy with a history of left-hand leg preference since he was three to four months old. And the question that, that was presented, what, what was the cause of his cerebral palsy? And he, he had an interestingly uninteresting uh, story with, he was a good student, he excelled in math, he was average in reading, he had somewhat poor handwriting, but otherwise uh, unremarkable story, including his developmental trajectory. The cause of his cerebral palsy was pretty easy to, dis to discern. Uh, as you can see here, he had what was very likely to be a perinatal arterial ischemic stroke involving the posterior branch of the left middle cerebral artery. But despite this significant brain injury that from stroke, that uh, if it happened in adulthood or even later childhood would likely be much more uh, compromising for his function, he really performed well, including strong scores on his language. Uh, and his processing speed was good, had, had strong memory. I found this to be fascinating. My graduate work was in uh, development and differentiation of cortical areas. So I was very interested in plasticity always. To me, this was the most profound example of plasticity. And as Jules Cotard opined in 1868, a student of uh, Charcot, uh, he wrote, it is quite remarkable that regardless of the site of cerebral lesion, hemiplegics from infancy never show aphasia, even when the whole left hemisphere is atrophied. Somewhat hyperbolic statement, but note, this is 1868, around the same time that localization of function in the brain, the era of, of Broca and Wernicke and Lichtheim, uh, that there was a recognition that perhaps there were some different rules at play when the injury happened quite early. So. I set out to ask the question, how do you understand what, what is going on in terms of the plasticity of the developing brain? How can we study it? The Washington University was a, was a pioneer in, in functional neuroimaging. I decided to transition to becoming a developmental cognitive neuroscientist at a time when there really wasn't uh, a, a field as of yet. So uh, an exciting and daunting transition. So today I'm gonna to talk a bit about the, the thought process for leveraging neuroimaging data for understanding individuals and individual differences in the context of development and plasticity. And then the second part of the talk to focus on heterogeneity and the implications, both clinical and scientific for the populations of patients that we, that we serve. So the, the introduction I had into this field was to really, it required basic uh, understanding of how to ask questions in cognitive development using brain imaging. As I said, in the late 90s, there wasn't much in the pediatric realm. So uh, working with uh, my mentor and then 20 years colleague, Steve Peterson, who just recently retired, one of the pioneers in, in functional neuroimaging at WashU, we created this, at the time, relatively large data set of over 100 individuals, eight to 32 years old, doing lexical processing tasks. And what I mean by lexical processing is single word tasks. You present a word like uh, a, a uh, wall and you ask the, the subjects to come up with a verb. 
like kick to, to correspond to that word. So that would be a, a, a generation task, but you might also ask somebody to just read a word out loud or repeat a word they hear, those sorts of single word tasks. And over the course of several years, we demonstrated how to uh, deconfound the contributions of performance, uh, reaction time and accuracy, and age on the brain activation patterns. So we see age performance independent regions, regions that modulate activity based on level of performance, regions that change their activity based on age independent of performance. In red, regions that increase with age, blue, regions that decrease with age on both sides of the brain. And because we had a reasonably large cohort uh, that we could bin across age ranges, we could demonstrate sort of qualitatively the transition that this region, for example, that grows up as it goes from seven to eight-year-olds up to adulthood, and other regions that grow down, such as this one in the uh, angular gyrus. So that, um, that work put us in a position to then ask, what about a patient like this one that, who I met uh, in, in clinic? So my, one of my first graduate students, Damian Fair, who's now an endowed professor at uh, University of Minnesota running a, a a Institute for Child Development there, he took on the task of, of asking questions using that normative data set that we had to then apply it to patients like this one here. And in 2006, published this uh, sort of case report in neurology, but it, what it, it did was it used the normative data set to sort of standardize the expected activation at a given age range for this individual, <clears throat> that patient scanned at age nine and then age 13, he was scanned again a couple of years after that. But this paper demonstrates how to use age and uh, age matched cohorts to sort of Z normalize the activity for that patient compared to the, the normative group, and then map the activity of this individual at different time points compared to the age matched cohort. I'm not gonna dive into the details of what we described in this paper, or except to say that it demonstrated the ability to use normative data sets to um, understand an individual. But at that time, I was also collecting um, patients in a hemiplegic cerebral palsy clinic, and it became clear that the heterogeneity of reasons for children to present with hemiplegic cerebral palsy was so great that we really would require a greater uh, set of tools to, to deal with the anatomical variation that uh, was underlying uh, the, these present, clinical presentations. So it was clear that our, at that time, just 10, 12 years ago, we really didn't have the, the toolkit available to us yet, but that evolved. And part, part of the way that that evolved was the advent of something called functional connectivity MRI. And what what functional connectivity refers to is that the, especially in the resting state, so a subject in the scanner not being asked to do anything other than to hold still, um, you see that a brain region on the left hemisphere and its homotopic region on the right hemisphere, that if you look at the spontaneous fluctuation of fMRI bold signal, say coming from the left hemisphere, looks pretty noisy, but if you map on the activity from its homotopic partner, you see a relatively high temporal correlation between the, what appeared to be sort of noisy signal. The Pearson R for that is 0.6. That is the measure, the metric of functional connectivity. The idea being that functionally related regions have highly correlated signal even at rest. And that observation that was actually made in, in the mid 90s, but laid dormant for years in the early 2000s started to pick up, but by the by later part of the first decade of two, in the 2000s, it transformed cognitive neuroscience. And there's been this explosion of the use of this metric to understand functional organization and architecture of the brain, including its development. And we've been able to do really pretty remarkable things with this measure, like parcelate individual functional areas and then map uh, brain areas into a network space and then remap back onto the surface of the brain to show 
modules or, or systems or networks on the brain and then attribute uh, using network analytic tools, network uh, properties to uh, brain regions. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there, not, not, for, the, not a, for the scope of this talk, but it really it changed, it transformed the way we thought about how to image and take advantage of imaging data to understand brain organization. This paper uh, from Jonathan Power from now 10 years ago was our first effort to parcelate the functional brain systems and map them onto the surface of the brain. You see there are regions that are sort of processing, visual, auditory, somatomotor, top-down control regions, our, our nomenclature, frontal parietal, singuloparicular, color mapped here. These are brain regions, or brain systems that have top-down influence on processing systems going beyond the sort of low bar organizational scheme um, that are as, uh, sort of classically taught in terms of the brain's organization. But we recognized that from, really from the get-go that we had to understand how to take advantage of uh, the data to understand individuals. And the idea that really drove this from group to individual sensibility is that standard clinical neuroimaging of patients with common conditions like ADHD and autism and Tourette, you, if it turns out you sent that patient to, to, to get an MRI of the brain, almost always the radiologist reads the study as normal appearing. And that it takes group level, high, high sample number group level analyses of data to, to see subtle and reliable effects. So how can we use brain imaging data to impact the diagnosis and prognosis of individuals? And the contention was and remains that there's much more information available in even a standard clinical MRI that's recognized than is uh, read out sort of qualitatively by the, by the clinician, the radiologist. So the question was, is it sufficient to classify and predict individuals uh, and that, that was the question posed by Nico Dosenbach, who at the time was um, doing a, he had done his PhD with Steve Peterson and myself, and then he um, got into the neuroscience track for pediatric neurology and had a year where he stepped away to do research. And the, the, the task that I asked him to take on was to take our pretty large normative data set of, of functional MRI and functional connectivity MRI data and to see if he could figure out whether we could predict individual brain maturity from just brief uh, scans, brief five minute, roughly five minute scans. And the approach was to use machine learning, uh, support vector machine strategy. We had multiple large data sets. Here's one, 61 children, 61 adults, only about five minutes of resting state data per individual. And he was able, he wrote the code and figured out how to do this uh, uh, appropriately, the binary classification was about 91% accurate, highly reliable. When this came out, um, uh, published in Science, we got kind of a, a, a somewhat, uh, well, that's cool, lots of attention, but also a little bit of snark. If you want to figure out how, some, how old somebody is, why are you putting them in a scanner? Just look at their birth date. And the, and the argument is, for proof of principle kind of approaches to investigation, when you know the answer, uh, it, it allows you to feel confident in the, uh, in the return of the classification accuracy, for example. So in situations when you don't know the answer, it's a bootstrap to get you there. Support vector machine uh, also allows for regression in uh, N-dimensional space. And so it, part of this study also included the creation of a functional connectivity maturation index where we could uh, predict on a continuum the essentially the, based on chronological age, the expected maturation index with about 55% of the variance explained also reliable. That work led to a whole spate of papers from our group and then uh, others were involved in this as well from outside of our group. But for example, we were able to classify six month old versus 12 month old infants using the resting state connectivity. Um, that's work by John Pruitt and colleagues. Deanna Green, we were able to classify whether a child had Tourette or not based on their connectivity. Chris Smizer, 
we were able to predict whether a baby was born prematurely or not. Uh, in this paper from uh, Emerson et al, we were able to predict which high risk for autism of a child born, an infant born to a family that an older child with uh, autism. So the, the, when that situation occurs, any given child born into that situation has about a 20% likelihood of developing uh, or meeting criteria for autism at age two years. We were able to demonstrate using the functional connectivity metrics that at six months, the data could predict which of those kids was gonna go on to, to get the diagnosis at two years. And additional work, uh, uh, Ashley Nielsen in the lab, um, I think my, my last graduate student, she's demonstrated that we could predict which adult uh, has Tourette or not based on functional connectivity. All these demonstrations, making the case that there's sufficient information in brief uh, MRI uh, data collections to make these single individual level predictions. Now this approach did not really capitalize on the systems level organization of the brain, again, shown here from Jonathan Power's work. It capitalized on sort of feature relationships, not systems level. The, the uh, ability to use the systems level organization really shifted uh, it, about six years ago, this paper by Tim Lauman uh, from the group, he, he's now a psychiatry resident at WashU. But what happened is around 2011, 2012, Russell uh, Poldrack, who was running imaging at UT Austin, and then now is at Stanford, he started to collect fMRI data on himself on a daily basis for a, a year, as well as um, a lot of other biometric measurements. And he shared that data set with us and others to, to help figure out how to analyze it best. And this paper from, from Tim Lauman and, and our collective group demonstrated that this individual, this is Russ Poldrack's brain, uh, aligns very nicely with group level data, but also has some distinction. So here on the medial surface, you see uh, nice similarities here in the uh, uh, SMA, but on the medial surface for visual cortex, you also see it at, for Russ, you see a nice Calcarin cortex, a primary visual cortex that's not evident in the group. And by contrast, in the group, you see a nice division between the sort of face representation and the body in the somatomotor cortex, but that distinction is not evident in the individual. The point being that there's a lot of similarities, but you can see a distinct contrast of the individual to the group, the group looking much more smoothed. So Nico, who I mentioned earlier now as a junior faculty member with his startup package, he wanted to um, take advantage of this precision mapping of individuals using fMRI, but he also wanted to, to save his dollars because as a junior faculty member, you wanna be really cautious. So he, he figured out that because the scan charges at WashU and like many other places between midnight and 6 a.m. drop precipitously, he cajoled his friends and himself, he's MSC number two over here, to scan themselves repeatedly over a stretch of time and to create what is now called the Midnight Scan Club. That's the MSC here. 10 individuals, typical, um, although not truly typical, these are primarily graduate students and junior faculty at a major medical center. So not truly typical, but um, but it had a variety of, of, uh, of, of uh, qualities that wouldn't necessarily be uh, sampled in a standard uh, data collection. But here they are in, in full detail, there are 10 different maps and you see the uh, average of those 10. This data set became very valuable. And one of the first papers that came out of it, sorry, uh, published now four years ago by Evan Gordon et al. from the group, demonstrated that uh, run by run, individuals really looked a lot like themselves, but not a whole lot like each other, except at the average of the group, individuals resembled the average pretty well. So you see individuals compared to themselves along the diagonal, mostly 
highly reliable within and not so similar between. But then you have a subject like this one here who uh, is also hardly reliable within. Well, this individual fell asleep a lot during the scan and moved more, so had a different level of quality of data. So here you see the heterogeneity of individuals. Um, they look similar overall with the way the, the networks are mapped on the surface of the brain, but they don't look um, much like each other in terms of the correlation matrix. You move into uh, other parts of the brain, we were able to parcelate the posterior fossa, the, cer the, the cerebellum. Using this approach, we we're also able to parcelate the uh, subcortical structures like the basal ganglia and thalamus shown here. The point being made on this slide is that the reliability of brain systems mapping into the globus pallidus is, is less than for the thalamus. And we find that when you place a deep brain stimulator to treat essential tremor in the thalamus, you have a more reliable outcome than when you uh, place electrodes in the DBS, uh, DBS electrodes in the globus pallidus for Parkinson's disease. And one reason may be that the mapping of brain systems is more highly reliable into the thalamus than the globus pallidus. But the real payoff came from this approach with this paper by uh, Tim Lauman again. This is a, I love this paper because it's a return to what got me fired up about the topic in the first place. Here's an individual who came to clinical attention because his select baseball coach said, he just doesn't seem to have as much power as I would expect given how, how strong he appears to be. There's something wrong with his dexterity but he was otherwise uh, playing at a, at a select baseball level as a 14 year old. And Nikos saw him in clinic, got a scan and found this remarkable demonstration of presumed early brain injury from perinatal stroke, perhaps in the setting of a, a viral illness. And you see measurements here for his neuropsych testing and his motor testing, he's pretty good. Uh, he wouldn't necessarily stand out based on, uh, on, on academic or clinical measures. He does have some significant dexterity issues, but again, functionally, he was able to do things like play baseball at a reasonably high level. And because of this precision mapping approach, we're able to understand how his individual functional neuroanatomy and structural neuroanatomy is organized and how it relates uh, to, to uh, the group. To, we could compare the network organization in him. For example, he does show this uh, body face distinction in the left hemisphere, like we, we see it at the group level. And we're able to map what is likely to be his uh, left motor cortex and his right motor cortex, just as examples. So, I, I sort of pointed out earlier on that early, earlier we didn't really have the toolkit to ask these kinds of questions, but now we do. Now we have a deeper understanding of how to do this precision individual level mapping. <clears throat> We're not the only ones who are taking this approach. I just want to highlight a study. This is from a Ted Satterthwaite's group at uh, CHOP. They're doing something very similar. Their topology of brain systems is a bit different than ours, but generally the same. But what they're able to, to demonstrate is at a single individual level, topology and network size as it relates to a behavioral measure like executive functioning, both in children and adults. So the field is really shifting to embrace precision mapping and relating network organization and architecture to um, important behavioral measures. Okay, so now I just wanna to switch to discussing heterogeneity and some of the, what I think are important clinical implications for it. And to do so, I'm gonna, again, start out with a case. Now you heard earlier that I, my, one of my clinical interests is in Tourette syndrome. Back in 2003, I saw a then 12 year old boy who had a five year history of tics, 
he came with the referral because of a recent severe exacerbation and violent self-injurious actions directed at himself and his mother, which uh, we saw those behaviors manifest in, in the clinical visit. He had seen a, a number of prior neurologists and psychiatrists. He had the whole slew of comorbid diagnoses that come along for the ride with Tourette. He had been on multiple psychotropic agents without consistent benefit. <clears throat> and I should say that each of the choices that had been made by the prior clinicians were arguably evidence-based uh, for, for, for the medications trialed. And this includes medic medications across multiple uh, classes. His family history was interesting for mom having anxiety disorder and history of tics. Dad had ADHD. And um, I think it, for those of you who see patients with the, these diagnoses, you know that when you see this Tourette Plus presentation, it's very common for the parents to have uh, pieces of, if not entirely, the same um, spectrum of diagnosis. And on exam, he was ticking continuously, <clears throat> showing lots of copra phenomenon uh, that included uh, the uh, foul gestures, but also uh, really a, a, what could be interpreted as aggressive language against the, uh, the team. It was a very difficult presentation and um, and he, he actually spiraled over the, the next several months, he got worse uh, before he got better. But I'll tell you that he did get better. <clears throat> and it's because we had a psychologist who understood how to implement habit reversal therapy, which is really a, pr a precursor, has been known to be effective for OCD, but was a precursor to what is now called comprehensive behavioral intervention for tics and evidence-based behavioral intervention. And uh, that, it took about seven or eight years later before the, the, the clinical trials for CBIT were published, but there was clear evidence earlier on that this approach could pay off and it allowed his most clinically significant tics to resolve. Uh, it allowed us to start implementing cognitive behavioral therapy to address his anxiety and OCD. And that subsequently led to significant reduction in medications. So a good turnout, I haven't talked to him in years, but he graduated college and um, seemed to be on a very good pathway uh, years later. But the question is, why did medications fail him? And why did habit reversal therapy succeed? And could we have come to a more effective intervention promptly for him? And more generally, is there truly an evidence basis for treating this individual? I mentioned earlier that arguably all the medications that were tried were evidence-based. However, he would not have uh, been included in any of those clinical trials because of his complex comorbidities. <clears throat> so if, there, if he couldn't have been part of the sample, is it reasonable to say the evidence basis applies to him? So this brings me to one of my favorite papers, uh, one that I relied on quite a bit in my uh, Tourette's clinic, which I had for about 20 years. This is a paper studied uh, that was published by the Tourette's Syndrome Study Group in 2002 and had uh, 148 patients divided up into these four groups, <clears throat> treatment with methylphenidate alone, clonidine alone, the combination of the two, or placebo. And it's a really influential study that demonstrates the benefit of the combined therapy. <clears throat> for example, for ADHD scores, the combination of methylphenidate and clonidine alone was better than, uh, the combination of the two was better than either one alone for treating ADHD. <clears throat> and that was also true for um, ticks. And this is the important, for me, a really important study that shows that methylphenidate does not make tics worse in patients that have both tics and ADHD. When you see an exacerbation in the methylphenidate arm, it's no more common than in the placebo arm. And by four months, the separation is clear. But an underappreciated part of this paper, and I think an underappreciated part of the, this approach to clinical trials is the non-response group. <clears throat> 
So this table shows <clears throat> the percentage of subjects judges having improved on a clinical global impression scale, their symptoms for ADHD and tics. And whether you're looking at the ADHD or the tick group, there's a significant number, anywhere from 15 to 45% who don't seem to respond. That's true even for the combined groups. <clears throat> who are those individuals? Who are the individuals who are not responding to the therapy? Our clinical trial design is not set up to answer that question. So um, I wanna point out a, a paper. So I, I mentioned Damien Fair, who's now at Minnesota. He went on to do a postdoc at uh, OHSU uh, with Joel Nigg uh, and uh, Bonnie Nagel. Joel is a, a, a superb ADHD investigator. And Damien published his paper in PNAS almost 10 years ago now showing the following. They deeply phenotyped uh, a sample of, of children with ADHD across a number of different measures and then used a unsupervised uh, machine learning approach and demonstrated that within the, the ADHD group, there were subgroups that were separable based on how they performed on these different phenotypic tests. And so it's possible that, for example, a non-responsive group in a clinical trial might be explainable by being part of one of these subgroups. But if you don't ask the question, you won't know. But what's really interesting also in this paper is that when they looked at the typically developing controls that were also deeply phenotyped, they found a similar kind of structure within that group subgrouping that also was separable based on the response to this deep phenotyping approach. So even the typically developing controls have heterogeneity. Not a big surprise, but in clinical trial designs, both ADHD and the typically developing controls, for example, would be viewed as coming from a similar homogeneously distributed variance population, set of populations and then you look at the central tendency effects uh, for each of the groups, not recognizing heterogeneity within. So there's this interesting paper that was published in 2018 by Deepman Cartwright, part of a special issue of social science and medicine called Understanding and Misunderstanding Randomized Controlled Trials. And um, the, the way this special issue is set up, there's the index paper and then a whole host, a couple dozen commentaries on it, and then a response to the commentary. So I think it's really worth diving into. <clears throat> Their argument is the following. They argue <clears throat> that the lay public and researchers put way too much trust in RCTs over other methods, that the special status is unwarranted, that randomization does not equalize everything other than treatment in the treatment and control groups, that it doesn't automatically deliver a precise estimate of the average treatment effect, and it doesn't relieve us of the need to think about higher order complex interactions. They argue that it does provide an unbiased estimate of the trial sample, but you need much more justification to generalize beyond the sample. And you need justification to apply the results to any individual within this, including within the trial itself. So the, the, their criticism is that the focus is often on internal validity of the study, but not on external validity and generalizability because of the, of the uh, approach to uh, central tendency driven uh, observation and reporting. Now, this is all happening in the context of, I think the, Pediatricians on the call will agree improvements in pediatric care over the generations. That preventative strategies have reduced total annual pediatric inpatient admissions. There's a lot more uh, survival into adulthood for children with severe life-threatening illnesses, children with complex chronic conditions. And while the total pediatric inpatient admissions are down, just talk to your hospital administrators about how over the years there have been a dwindling of overall inpatient beds the percentage of admissions for children with complex chronic conditions is increasing. So the typical inpatient census 
in pediatric hospitals is way more complex than that service that Vinay and I shared uh, experience on in 1994. It's particularly true for critical care. So here's a couple of papers. I, I won't it just basically said what I what I say what I just said. And so I'll just point out <clears throat> this nice slide that shows the sort of the proportionate use of hospital, especially critical care resources for children with complex chronic disease versus no chronic disease and non-complex chronic disease. So there's, if you look at who is in the ICU uh, and who's in there for longer numbers of longer stays and greater use of resources like mechanical ventilation, it's the complex chronic disease patients. Well, who are those patients? They're very often patients with neurodevelopmental disorders like TP, epilepsy, uh, intellectual developmental disabilities, autism, congenital heart disease, which is high risk for NDD, neurodevelopmental disorders, hemonc patients, same, and others as well. Just not intended to be comprehensive, but just recognizing who is concentrated in the critical care settings. And um, I, I think it's important to, for, for context to think about what it is uh, that, that is underlying the, the neurodevelopmental presentation of those patients. There's a very nice paper from the a group at Geisinger points out that neurodevelopmental disorders can be caused by many different kinds of genetic abnormalities, individually rare, but collectively common. And that specific causes are shared among disorders thought to be clinically distinct, and that developmental brain dysfunction, that a given variant can result in various manifestations and a given phenotype can result from various variants. The, the true mapping is not one-to-one. -one. And importantly, they make the argument that penetrance is for deleterious variants is, can be thought of as nearly 100% when traits like IQ or uh, social behaviors or motor behaviors are considered as continuous and quantitative and not dichotomous and uh, qualitative. So um, they also point out in this nice paper, the myriad of uh, etiological factors that drive developmental brain dysfunction and not as well represented as I would like in this, in this schema is the, how they all interact with each other. So for example, certain genetic variants may make hypoxic ischemic uh, milieus even more problematic than if you don't have that variant. So interactions amongst etiological factors and then the myriad ways that developmental brain dysfunction can manifest. This group um, also made, a, I think, a really influential and important argument about the contribution of background genetics in uh, driving the proband's uh, phenotypic manifestation. So here we're looking at copy number variant syndromes of, of influences on full-scale IQ scores. In the top, this is a copy number variant for 22Q11.2. Uh, centered around uh, 100 for IQ, as, as you would expect for the general population, and then a definitional intellectual and developmental disabilities uh, threshold of two standard deviations below the mean for uh, the cutoff for uh, IDD. And you see that the proband IQ distribution uh, surrounds that uh, IQ of 70, two SDs below the mean. They, in this paper, and then followed up in a subsequent paper I'll show you in a moment, they looked at the IQs of parents of children with 16P11.2, whoops, and then the, sorry, and then the um, IQs of, of, of the patients. And you'll notice this shift to the right for the parents, probably ascertainment bias, but a con concomitant shift to the right for the probands suggesting the important role of the parental IQ in modulating the phenotypic manifestation on, on IQ. They, uh, this paper lays it out in some more detail, uh, theoretically on 
how if you don't take into account the parental background genetics, you might come to the conclusion that a given copy number variant has no effect on neurobehavioral development or motor, or motor development, but perhaps only on cognitive development. But if you take into account the parental IQ, you see the penetrance across all of these domains. This paper followed up a couple of years later, now more deeply quantifies the effect they're talking about for IQ and social responsiveness scale, a, a neurobehavioral measure that, that uh, is linked to autism, the motor test of the Purdue pegboard. And you can see the, the parents, the unaffected uh, SIB, and then the probands, and a quantification of the shift that the copy number variant 16P11.2 produces in these different measures, and then mapped onto individual families, making the point that without that parental background information, you're not gonna be able to understand the, uh, uh, the effect of that deleterious variant on that proband, on the individual. So this is, uh, again, this is the Geisinger group. This is um, David Ledbetter, who's since left, but this, uh, I think a really profound contribution making the argument that a dichotomous all or none approach to diagnoses uh, is, does not demonstrate, does not allow you to see that the penetrance of a disorder um, is, is full. They make the case that although such approaches may appeal to our tendency to adopt simplified heuristics, they fail to recognize the complexity of a more nuanced quantitative underlying biological reality. I think that's a really important point. A additional, I think, drive point to be made here is that these patients in the ICU with developmental brain dysfunction, the next time they come in because of HIE or overwhelming infection or a metabolic crisis, it's not like the genetic background has gone away. The context for that critical illness uh, in an already adversely affected a brain in terms of its developmental trajectory continues to have these underlying factors that interact with the next illness. Our approach to understanding their clinical outcomes does not mm. typically incorporate the full array of underlying uh, risk factors, ideological factors that uh, contribute to a greater risk for poor outcome, and they should. So again, who are these patients in our ICUs? They're very commonly those that have these, uh, these high risk for neurodevelopmental disorders or the, have them themselves. So let's look at CP and general heart disease real quickly. CP of course is defined as a non-progressive disorder of the motor system. Uh, it is comorbid with a, a number of these diagnoses. It's about two to three per thousand, which hasn't changed much over decades. And the primary ideologies have largely focused on prematurity, perinatal uh, brain injury, uh, term-related uh, injuries. But in recent years, there's really growing evidence for contributions for, from rare genomic variants. And actually that uh, aligns with longstanding recognition of inherited uh, aspects of cerebral palsy dating back to the, really the origins of the diagnosis. Again, the Geisinger group published earlier this year, looking at a, a large, their large clinical laboratory cohort, but also a healthcare-based cohort. This is, includes trios, this is really adults. And the, the upshot is that uh, in these two cohorts, they found pretty, pretty significant prevalence of pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants that uh, anticipated a whole array of different types of inheritance patterns included uh, single nucleotide variants as well as copy number variants. And they asked the question, which I think is the right one as I've highlighted, to what extent do those same variants continue to be vulnerable to subsequent challenges with the next illness that that patient experiences? In congenital heart disease, we know it affects about 1% of live births. We know that aneuploidies and copy number variants are responsible for about a quarter of those patients' uh, congenital heart disease, and that they have an increased risk for neurodevelopmental disorders, as well as extracardiac congenital anomalies, 
And the more severe your congenital heart disease is, the more likely you are to have neurodevelopmental disabilities. Now, historically, the explanations have been focusing on embryonic circulatory deficits, postnatal pathophysiology, the consequences of therapies, interventions, surgeries, cross clamp times, et cetera. But again, just like in the CP story, there's a recent recognition of shared gen genetic liability that was not previously a significant consideration. So this is, a, I think, a really influential paper published in 2015 by Hamzi et al. They looked at uh, over a thousand trios that were in this Pediatric Cardiac Genetics Consortium. And um, they compared to the Simons Foundation Autism Simplex trios, looking at the unaffected parents and siblings and looked for de novo mutations and found, if you just focus on, for example, the children that had both uh, congenital heart disease and both neurodevelopmental disabilities and extra uh, cardiac congenital anomalies, a significant enrichment for deleterious variants. And those variants showed pleiotropy for brain and heart, uh, increased likelihood of uh, involvement if there was pleiotropy for brain and heart. Making the case that that causal mechanisms for neurodevelopmental disabilities in patients with congenital heart disease can have shared genetic effects as well as the effects uh, of the anomalous cardiac circulatory function, embryonic circulatory function, uh, postnatal effects, and so on. It's not exclusive, but that the, the underlying pleiotropic effects uh, suggest shared mechanistic uh, involvement. And these same genetic liabilities may contribute to ongoing consequences of subsequent critical illness. Again, these are patients more likely to be in the ICU for another admission, for another admission. So critical care outcome studies like ECMO or you name it, probably ought to incorporate the, these background information to help understand modulation of, of outcomes. So, um, Hope I left some time for questions. My, my, the summary is brief. It's just that I think we are transitioning to a developmental cognitive neuroscience that can address individuals and individual differences, and that addressing heterogeneity and embracing complexity, including through recognizing individual differences, should have significant clinical and scientific implications. So I'll just say thank you to, I mentioned the work of a subset of all the people I've collaborated with over the years. Here they are, multiple sources of funding, and I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for such a uh, awesome talk. I have a few questions, uh, Dr. Schadler. Do you, do you have time to answer a couple of them? Of course. Perfect. So Dr. Puri asks, um, does the plasticity have a ceiling effect in terms of age of the patient and the time of their injury? And uh, how do we prognosticate and treat so the, uh, the, the those nuances of plasticity uh, have not have not been well uh, worked out at the group level, certainly not at the individual level. But I think there's increasing recognition of the importance of, of asking how age, time of injury, and age uh, interact to uh, influence potential for plasticity. Uh, it, there's probably going to be a multitude of complex interactions that uh, intrinsic factors that that contribute to an individual's capacity for plasticity, plus the circumstances of the injury and when they occur. Um, so it's a great question, and I think it's a, a, an open area for investigation. And what was the subsequent question? So the, the question is: um, Is it, does it involve like how to prog does it involve like the prognostication of the treatment of any of those children with TBI or any other like a uh, intracranial injury? Yeah, I th so um, I don't think we're there yet. I think we what we have is sort of central tendency driven um, data to help with general prognostication. But I, I think that a deeper dive into understanding how individual differences uh, influence plasticity will allow us to be more precise in turn with the way we prognosticate and make choices for uh, approaches to intervention. We have another question. Um, this is an interesting question. Did age 
alone or is it associated with like bone age, sexual maturity rating, have correlation with fMRI maturation? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I haven't seen anything about bone age, but it, the, the question about sexual maturation is a really key one. Um, we, like many, have been, I think, either lazy or unimaginative over the years to, to use chronological age uh, as a bludgeon for asking about development. It's, not, it's really not a good uh, x-axis uh, number. There really should be greater um, use of information like sexual maturation rating to, to help um, uh, deal with some of the, the unexplained variance that happens along the x-axis for chronological age. Um, large scale studies like the HBC, like the ABCD study that's going on now, this uh, attempt is to study 10,000 children longitudinally, uh, two dozen sites across the country, multi million dollar, multi tens of million dollars study, um, is more advised now and is taking into account deeper appreciation of uh, what the x axis really should look like. So yeah, I think it's the, it's the right question. And unfortunately the field uh, is relatively late to embrace that. Um, my colleague, Dr. Caracas asked this question. Uh, the question is, is the fMRI and the functional connectivity has been used for memory lateralization? Oh, certainly. Uh, mem uh, basically um, all I think major cognitive domains have been looked at in terms of uh, mapping of brain systems and also a asymmetry of those mappings at the group level. And I, I, think, um, I think what's coming with precision mapping uh, approaches at the individual level is understanding uh, heterogeneity in that lateralization as well. And what that lateralization and other topological factors uh, contribute to um, effectiveness of, of function in those different domains. And, and he also has another question. Does the MRI data for functional connectivity has been correlated with the intracranial EEG data? Uh, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's pretty cutting edge stuff. It's, it's happening um, in major centers that have the capacity to, that, that have the capacity to do intracranial EEG. Um, so, the, so the upside is uh, it is happening. It's usually in the setting of, of groups that are doing pre-surgical planning. The downside is that, of, of course, who is it that's getting that information acquired are people that need intracranial EEG. Um, the, 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 really, the history of, of brain mapping goes back to uh, people like Penfield, uh, people like uh, George Ogeman, more modern, who um, you took advantage of the opportunity to have uh, the, the, the intracranial context of it, contents available to do such mapping. So it's it really, uh, I think we'll learn a lot about that relationship between functional MRI and EEG, for example, uh, even though it's coming from uh, individuals who have uh, su sufficient pathology that leads them to that, that circumstance. I have another question. And uh, this is with regards to the RCT, and is there any influence of placebo papers um, and how they influence the outcome of control to the treatment group if it's imbalanced? The placebo, yeah. So, uh, the, so um, can you ask that question again? Yeah, so with regard to randomized control studies, um, do you think the Hall and Kapchuk placebo papers have any influence regarding the outcome of the control and treatment group if imbalanced? Uh, I, I need to, I don't know. I, I need to, uh, to, to read that work. Uh, so uh, if, uh, if you shoot me an email, um, I, I would appreciate my own education, edification there. Or maybe um, somebody can, I don't know if you're able to unmute and uh, comment if, if you have a perspective on that one. Maybe. I would be delighted to hear it. I'm not sure okay. if anybody is able to that ask that can unmute. We'll work on it. And in the meantime, uh, Dr. Puri asks, why do disorders like Tourette's and developmental uh, disorders occasionally have rapid 
uh, sudden onset and, and uh, you know, sudden termination? Well, the, the sudden onset, I think, is, um, is uh, a, almost a psychophysics perception that, that pe people experience them and, and parents have, that uh, they remember the day before they, they didn't notice the ticking. And then you take a history and you find out that there were subtle uh, features that are already present that just perhaps weren't recognized as such. Um, the, uh, the sudden cessation too. So there's work, Vinay, there's work that uh, I and my colleagues still in St. Louis, Kevin Black, uh, Deanna Green, who's now in uh, at UC San Diego. We, we've been looking at um, ticking in children that are thought to have their ticks remitted, but we put them in a room with a camera and just ask them to sit still and uh, they're still ticking. So the, there's also, I think, a perception of ticks going away when, um, when they just have no longer are meeting the threshold for awareness from the, the, the observer. So uh, I think it's an open question about the abruptness uh, of, of onset and offset um, from a mechanistic standpoint. I, I think it's, it has a lot to do with uh, perception from the person experiencing it and those observing it. Uh, do you have a time for answering one more question, Dr. Shank? Sure, yeah. Dr. P asked one more question, and he, uh, the question is, what about changing neurobiology causes movement disorders to emerge after 10 to 15 years after injury? Uh, it seems he saw a child who had an injury multiple years back and right now having movement issues. So I think that kind of, uh, that's, a, that's a great one, and I think that uh, is puzzling for uh, many clinicians. So I, my, my speculation is that, that if you think about the brain as a, as a complex system comprised of multiple complex systems, <clears throat> the, um, the uh, eventual uh, lack of synchrony, for example, that it would be necessary for appropriate control system, processing system interaction may eventually um, be lost in a, in a way that's sufficient to start manifesting uh, atypical function. And the time course for that playing out uh, may, may be, I don't necessarily understand why it plays out over a, a protracted period of time, but that, that process may be what it takes to have clinical pathologic manifestations show up uh, months, years after what would seem to be the proximate event. So, but but this, this is an interesting question, both in terms of developmental timing of um, the manifestation, like why do ticks emerge in, in six to nine-year-olds typically? Um, how, does that, how does that relate to the development of systems and, and why do atypical movements emerge uh, at various time courses after injury? Maybe a similar kind of uh, lack of cohesive interaction between brain systems that eventually manifest in, in those those clinical presentations, but it's a it's a uh, you know full speculation at this point. Thank you so much, Dr. Shagler. I want to thank you once again from Norton Neuron Science to uh, lend your time answering our question and giving a fabulous talk. Uh, and uh, we are about time. And thank you. And uh, uh, just to, for annunciation, uh, the pediatric grand round CME is one three zero four zero two.